video is going to be part one of two parts um, covering sections 1.1 and 1.2 from your textbook. And I've kind of combined the titles of those sections. Um, and this is functions and their graphs. So I've, I, I normally teach one point, I've combined the material from 1.1 and 1.2 together and kind of shifted things around. So that's why one video is not just 1.1 um, and another video of 1.2. So this is 1.1, 1.2, part one. Uh, and in part one, we're going to be defining what a function is, talking about the different representations of a function, um, looking at function notation, uh, and also domain and range of a function. So everything um, from here to here will be considered part one. And then part two is going to be looking at uh, the graphs of common functions that you guys should be familiar with up to now, uh, talking about how to classify, classify a function as even, odd, or neither, and what that means, and then also graphing piecewise to find functions, and that will end up being part two. Okay, so let's look at this first definition of a relation. And the word relation, uh, you might think of that being from the word relationship. Um, so a relation is a correspondence between two sets where each element in the first set called the domain corresponds to at least one element in the second set called the range. And for now, we're, we're going to be talking about um, sets of numbers. So where each element is a number belonging to the domain and then each um, element in the range is going to be a number in the range. So I'm going, a picture I always draw to represent this is let's say that this first, oops, this first circle represents the domain, set of numbers that belong to the domain so I'll label this as domain. And the second circle represents the range. Okay, and if I put a few numbers in my domain, how about one, two, three, four? Let's say those values belong to the domain. And then how about, I don't know, five? Uh, I'm skipping six, five, six, seven, eight, nine belong to the range. So for this picture to represent a relation, each element in the domain must correspond to at least key words here, at least one element in the second set called the range. Okay, so uh, we could say that one maps to five. And how about two maps to six as well as seven. And then maybe four could map to five as well as eight. And how about even nine? And three, let's say maps to to seven as well. So each element in the domain ends up mapping to at least or corresponding to at least one element in the range. So this leads us to our definition of a function, which is a very similar definition to relation. So a function is a correspondence between two sets for each element in the first set called the domain. Okay, so far everything's the same. Uh, corresponds to exactly one element in the second set called the range. So that's, that's the difference, right? Uh, for a relation, each element in the domain corresponds to at least one element in the second set called the range. For a function, each element in the domain corresponds to exactly one element in the range. So if I draw that same picture, okay, that's my first set 
the domain, say the second circle represents the range. We have our numbers, one, two, three, four, those are the elements of the domain, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, for this picture to represent a function, each element, each number belonging to the domain corresponds to exactly one element in the range. Okay, so one, let's say, maps to five. How about two maps to seven? Four maps to eight, and I'm, I'm just choosing what the values map to. Um, and then let's say three maps to, how about five as well? That's okay. Each element in the domain corresponds to exactly one element in the range. Okay, so it's important to note that not all functions are relations. However, not all relations are functions. Kind of like how um, all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares. Now there's different representations of functions that you guys should be familiar with. So functions can be represented numerically uh, with like a chart, table of values, data set, um, graphically. Uh, verbally, so like a word problem can describe a function, uh, and algebraically, so using some sort of a mathematical model or equation. So let's talk about functions defined by equations. Uh, typically a function represented by an equation uses the variables x and y, but other variables can be used, like other letters can be used uh, to represent the variables. x and y are common um, because we like to graph equations in the xy plane, also known as the Cartesian plane, um, where the horizontal axis represents, uh, we refer to usually as the x-axis, and the vertical axis represents uh, what we usually refer to as the y-axis. So x and y are commonly used uh, for as the letters to represent uh, the independent variable, and then y is commonly used to represent the dependent variable. And x can be any number in the domain and is referred to as the independent variable. y depends on what value of x is selected and is therefore referred to as the dependent variable. And we could say y is a function of x. Again, different letters can be used. It's also important to note that just because you see an equation does not mean that it represents a function. And we talked about this a little bit when we were, were reviewing graphing with our graphing calculators. So looking at these two equations here, they look very similar. On the left, we have y equals 2x squared. And then it's like the x and the y on the right just flip-flop. So on the right, we have the equation x equals to y squared. Well, if we choose, let me pick another color, the blue. Um, so if we choose an x value, so like let's let x equal to, how about four? On the left-hand side here, if we substitute four in for x, we would get y equals to 16. That means that the point 4 comma 16 would lie on the graph of y equals to x squared. So the input of 4, so 4 belongs to the domain, ends up corresponding to y equals to 16. So 16 would belong to the range for this equation. If we go over to the equation on the right hand side and we let 4 replace x with 4, we would have 4 equals to y squared. So just by inspection, we could look at that and say, well, since y is being squared, there's actually two values that y could be. y could be equal to positive 2 or negative 2. And we can write that as plus or minus 2. So 
when x is equal to 4, there's actually two points on the graph of x equals to y squared. We would have the point 4 comma negative 2 and the point 4 comma positive 2. So the input of 4 ends up corresponding to two outputs, meaning on the left, y equals to x squared, our input corresponded to exactly one output. And any input, you could think about it, any real number that you let x be equal to would end up um, corresponding to exactly one output. So this represents a function, this equation on the left. However, on the right, our input of 4 ended up corresponding to two outputs. So it means that, that x equals to y squared does not represent a function. It actually just represents a relation, which y equals to x squared is also a relation, but we're able to be more specific and define it to be a function. So on the right here is not a function. Okay, let's talk functions represented graphically now. Let's use another color. Okay, so functions can be graphed in the Cartesian plane, xy plane. Uh, and for the graph to represent a function, it must pass the vertical line test. Okay, and the vertical line test says, given a graph, if any vertical line that can be drawn intersects the graph at no more than one point, the graph defines y as a function of x. So for a graph to represent a function, it needs to pass the vertical line test. And the vertical line test really just goes back to the definition of a function, where every input must correspond to exactly one output. Every x value must correspond to exactly one y for a graph to represent a function. So let's look at these two, the graphs of these two equations. So we had just um, talked about how uh, one of these equations represented a function and one did not. So let's look at their graphs. And you guys at this point are familiar with both of these graphs. If you are not, you can always just plot points. Okay, so y equals to x squared, that's a parabola that has its vertex at the origin and opens up. And we said, okay, well, when x equals to 4, let's say that 4 is right there, uh, that y equals to 16. Right, x-axis, y-axis. Right, we, this is, let's say that's the point that we found. Um, now, for any vertical line that we could draw, the vertical line would end up intersecting the graph in exactly one point. So therefore, y equals to x squared passes the vertical line test, which I abbreviate as VLT and is therefore a function. However, x equals to y squared, that is also a parabola, but a parabola that opens to the right. Okay, and remember we said that when x was equal to 4, y ended up being equal to 2 and negative 2. Okay, so let's say those points are 2 and negative 2. So we can see just from those two points um, that if we draw a vertical line, it ends up hitting the graph 
in two places instead of just one. Um, now at x equals to zero, okay, so at the vertex of this parabola, um, the, you could draw a vertical line that would only intersect at one point, but it's because there exist vertical lines that would end up intersecting the graph in more than one place that the vertical line test fails. And therefore, this graph does not represent a function, which we already knew from examining the equation. But sometimes you're just given a graph, and you need to be able to identify whether or not the graph represents a function or not. All right, function nota notation is a handy dandy tool uh, for naming functions, especially if you are working with multiple functions. It allows you to see uh, what the input is. Uh, and like I said, just naming, if you're working with multiple functions, naming them, especially uh, next year in calculus, if you want to take a function's derivative, um, it helps you to then have the derivative named something else that relates back to the original function. Um, so that, that's why we use function notation. Most common symbol or name of a function is lowercase f of x. Um, it, and it can also be read f evaluated at x. Uh, and, and f of x represents the output value, the y value. Uh, so we could also, we represent ordered pairs that represent points on graphs as x comma y, but we can also represent them as x comma f of x, or whatever the function name is, like h of x, or t of x, or um, whatever, whatever function name you choose. So for y equals to f of x, or if you have a, a, uh, a function uh, using named f of x, then x would represent the input, the independent variable, f would be the function name, um, and then our output would be actually f of x. And you have some sort of mathematical rule um, that f of x is equal to. Super, just a few important pieces of information to remember. F of x does not mean f times x. Okay, the most common function names are lowercase f and uppercase uh, f, uh, but really most any letter can be used. Um, like g of x, g is commonly used, h is commonly used. Uh, the letter most commonly used for the independent variable is x, but also any letter can be used. Another common uh, independent variable would, would be t, like if the independent variable was time, representing time. And although we think of y and f of x as interchangeable, the function notation is useful when we want to consider two or more functions of the same independent variable, or when we want to evaluate a function at more than one argument. So we're just going to do a few examples practicing using function notation. So in A, we're being asked to find f of 2. So that means we're given that x is equal to 2 and we want to find the y value that goes with x equals to 2 or the output value for when x is equal to 2. So to do that, I'm going to replace x and when I replace x and substitute in 2, I'm going to use parentheses. It's just a good idea to use parentheses when you substitute values in so you don't have any issues with signs. Okay, and then that simplifies to be 4 plus 2, so 6. So this would tell us that the point that we know that lies on the graph of f would be 2 comma 6. Uh, and then if we want to find f of negative 1, again, we're given x is equal to negative 1, and we want to find the y-coordinate that goes with x equal to negative 1. So using parentheses, especially since we're inputting a negative value, we want to use parentheses. 
Okay, and negative one squared is positive one plus two would give us three. So negative one comma three would be a point on the graph of F. Okay, C is asking us a slightly different question. Uh, so we wanna find X such that F of X is equal to 16. So in this case, we're actually given Y and we wanna find X. So we'll replace F of X in the given equation with 16. plus two yeah and now we can just solve for x so we can subtract by two on both sides of the equation and then if we take this u square root method we would have x equals two plus or minus the square root of 14 which cannot square root 14 cannot be simplified because 14 does not have any perfect square factors so x is equal to positive square root of 14 and x is equal to negative uh, square root of 14. So that means uh, that the point, the squ positive square root of 14 comma 16 lies on the graph of f, as well as negative square root of 14 comma 16. Um, this still a function. It's okay that we end up with two x values that map to the same y value because each of those x values, each of those inputs end up corresponding to exactly one output still. We can also evaluate functions at expressions, okay? You will see this, uh, you will do this next year uh, when you are using the limit definition uh, to find the derivative of a function. So don't, don't worry about that too much, but it's good practice now. So we're replacing x in our equation with x plus 1. Okay, we can leave it like that, or if you want to multiply x plus 1 times x plus 1 out, you can. Please don't say that's x squared plus 1. You have to multiply out x plus 1 times x plus 1, which would be x squared and then plus 2x plus 1 plus 2, and we could actually just combine 1 and 2, combine like terms to get 3. Okay, this right here will be something you work with a decent amount in calculus. It's something called the difference quotient, but we're just going to use it to help us practice our function notation. So in coming up with the, the difference question or what this is equal to, we're going to evaluate our uh, function f at x plus h. Okay, so this, this first piece here, I'm going to put it in brackets. This represents x, f of x plus h. Okay, and then minus f of x. And we actually have to use brackets or parentheses there. All over H. And we can simplify this. Uh, we can multiply X plus H times X plus H out. We're going to end up distributing the minus there. So X squared plus 2XH plus H squared plus 2 minus x squared minus 2. And just for fun, why don't we combine like terms here. And you'll notice that x squareds cancel, 2s cancel. We could also factor a common factor of h out from the numerator. which then allows us to have the h in the denominator cancel. And we are left with, I'm running out of room, so I'm gonna go next to, next to it, um, to 2x plus h. Okay, just f practicing using function notation. All right, um, so let's practice reading a graph. 
and finding function values from the graph. So we're not given the equation here, although you could probably figure out what the equation is. Um, but let's read this graph, let's switch colors. Okay, so if we, this graph represents the function g. Uh, if we wanna find g of zero, that means x equals to zero, what's y? Okay, so that looks like zero comma negative four is a point on this graph, therefore g of zero would be equal to negative four. g of zero represents the y coordinate. Okay, g of two, well, here we go, here's the point on the graph where x is equal to two, that looks like the point two comma zero. So g of two would be equal to zero. Oh, extra step here, so three times g of negative one. So three times g of negative one, negative one comma negative three, Looks like the point on the graph where x is equal to negative 1. So g of negative 1 would be equal to negative 3. So 3 times negative 3 would be negative 9. And then find x such that g of x equals to negative 3. So what we want to do right now is find the y, sorry, find the x values such that y is equal to negative 3. And we already have one of those values, right? So where x is equal to negative 1. And then on the other side of the y-axis, it looks like we have the point 1 comma negative 3. So x is equal to negative 1 or x is equal to positive 1 for y to be equal to negative 3. Okay, so just uh, kind of a common mistake. If you're evaluating a function for a um, expression that is a sum, it's not equal to the function evaluated at each part of the sum. Uh, we will talk about when this hap what it means when this happens, but in general, you can't just pull a negative out of a function. And then if you're evaluating a function at, um, a quotient, you can't just evaluate the function for the numerator and the denominator. That's not how it works. I should maybe also add on here, uh, f of a times b is not equal to f of a times f of b. That's not true either. All right, so let's talk domain of a function. We've already talked domain of a function a little bit. But there are, you'll, re, you'll hear me refer to two different types of domains. Uh, an implicit domain, we don't usually refer to as being an implicit domain. Um, it's just the largest set of real numbers. Uh, you could think of it as like the largest possible domain, even though the domain might have infinitely many elements. You got to be careful with the adjectives you use. But it's it's the largest set of real numbers for which a function is defined and uh, the output of the function is a real number. So implicit domain is just, if I give you an equation and ask you to state the domain where you're taking into account any domain restrictions from like uh, the fact that the denominator can't be equal to zero uh, or you, you have to have a real output so you can't take the square root of a negative number, that's the domain that I'm asking you for. That's what I mean by implicit domain. Explicit domain is whenever we have to restrict an implicit domain, we explicitly state what the, that domain restriction is. Uh, an example of when we would restrict an implicit domain is, let's say, if our independent variable represents time, and time can't be negative. So you might have like a quadratic that represents um, projectile motion. So where the input is time, the output is the height of the object off of the ground. Um, 
the implicit domain of that quadratic would be all real numbers. However, we would need to restrict that domain uh, since the input be, would be representing time so that it's uh, all real numbers greater than or equal to zero or something like that. So in these examples, we're going to practice determining the domain of the given equation of a function. And these, each of these examples is asking for the implicit domain. Doesn't need to be written. It's just when you're being asked to state the domain, you're being asked for the implicit domain. And we're gonna, going to state, um, just for practice, let's state it in interval notation as well as set builder notation. I think your textbook usually uses interval. I know I've talked to Mr. Green and interval notation is going to be really important next year for calculus. Um, but let's just practice both, both notations. So for this first function, uh, this function is a fraction, and we know that we cannot have zero. We want to exclude values from the domain that would make the denominator equal to zero because that's going to be where the function is undefined. Uh, so we could say that x squared, for my work, I could say x squared minus 4 can't be equal to zero. Uh, and then I'm just going to factor as the difference of two squares So we see that x can't be equal to positive 2, uh, and x can't be equal to negative 2. So to state our domain in interval notation would be from negative infinity to negative 2, parentheses, union, negative 2 to 2, union 2 to infinity. We're just excluding those two values. Set builder notation, I think, is a little nicer for a domain like this where you're just excluding a couple values. Uh, so we use the curly bracket and say x is an element of the real numbers such that x cannot be equal to negative 2, x cannot be equal to positive 2, and close the curly bracket. Okay, so for g of x, this is square root of 2x plus 10. We know that 2x plus 10 has to be greater than or equal to 0. We subtract by 10 and then divide by 2. We get x is greater than or equal to negative 5. So in interval notation, negative 5 is included. And then all real numbers greater than or equal to negative 5. In set builder notation, we would say x is an element of the real numbers such that, and then you basically just use the inequality notation, x is greater than or equal to negative 5. Okay, c here is a little bit tricky. Uh, we have a function the equation is a fraction, but we also have that square root in the denominator. So x squared plus 2x minus 3, which is under the square root, is going to have to be strictly greater than 0, not greater than or equal to because that square root is in the denominator. It has to be strictly greater than. This is a quadratic inequality, so we need to factor the left-hand side. We have x plus 3, x minus 1. We put the values that would make the left-hand side on the analysis line. And then you can think about doing test values, or I know this is a parabola. x squared plus 2x minus 3 would be a parabola that would open up. So the graph would go from positive to negative to positive. And we want the values that would make that a true statement which would be from negative infinity to negative 3, not including 3. Union, positive 1, not including 1 though, to infinity. And in set builder notation, x is an element of the real numbers such that 
x is strictly less than negative 3 or x is strictly greater than 1. Okay, so we have, for each of these, I used interval notation first and then set builder notation. Okay, to find the range of a function, so all, uh, the range of a function is the complete set of all possible resulting values or y values of the dependent variable. To determine the range of a function, it's helpful to think about the graph of a particular function. Now, if you were trying to determine the domain uh, from a graph of a function, you would read the graph from left to right to determine the intervals of x values for which the function is defined. To determine the range, you would read the graph from bottom to top to determine the intervals of y values for which the function is defined. Okay. I'm going to end there, and in part two, we will just begin by discussing um, some of the common.